Hello, I'm Russell Haythorn with Denver 7 and welcome to Denver Decides. This community partnership is dedicated to accessible and transparent elections. The partnership includes the League of Women Voters of Denver, Interneighborhood Cooperation, and is presented by Denver 8 TV. Our mission today is to present a ballot issue forum in anticipation of the general election coming up on Tuesday, November 3rd. Among the numerous amendments and ordinance questions on this year's ballot is Proposition 113. This measure asks voters to affirm or reject the legislature's 2019 decision to join the National Popular Vote Compact. The agreement intends to commit a state's presidential election votes to the candidate who wins the most votes nationally rather than the candidate who wins the state. Our format for this forum will follow a basic debate outline with opening and closing statements, cross-examination, and will include responses to questions submitted by the forum organizers. Let's begin by meeting the participants who will present and discuss the pros and cons of Prop 113. Beginning at my right is Mr. Joe McClosey, a former Colorado State Representative and current consultant to Prop 113, and he will be speaking in favor of Proposition 113. And on my left is Mr. D.K. Williams, a 17-year Denver resident, former state chairman and legislative director of the Libertarian Party of Colorado, and former statewide candidate for office. And he will be speaking against Prop 113. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, sir. We will begin with one minute opening statements from both of these speakers. And Mr. McClosey, you get to go first. We're ready for your opening. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for enjoying this discussion. I'm encouraging you to vote yes on Proposition 113 because the most votes for the presidency of the United States should win and every vote should count equally, regardless of your political party membership or what state you reside in. At its core, the national popular vote is an agreement between the states of which Colorado is a member to award their respective electoral college votes to the presidential candidate who receives the highest national popular vote in all 50 states while still preserving the electoral college. The problem is that five out of 45 presidents, or 11% of our presidents, have won the White House without winning the national popular vote. The second problem is a small number of swing states or battleground states like Florida wield way too much political and public policy influence and receive billions of billions of dollars of extra federal grant money. This is a bipartisan effort that you'll see throughout the evening, as well as over 200 local organizations and officials. I look forward to the dialogue. Mr. McClosey, thank you for that opening statement. And now, Mr. Williams, it is your turn for your opening statement. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak on this very important constitutional issue. And there's a lot of constitutional history and philosophy behind the original establishment of the Electoral College and why it exists. And it's a whole lot to get into more than we can right now. But I ask you all to consider a no vote on Proposition 113 on this issue in an effort to rate retain Colorado sovereignty and not hand it over, not surrender it to other more populous states. I think the underlying premise, and I think Mr. McClosey expressed this well, and I understand it, the underlying premise is that democracy is always the best method of governing. And the closer we can get to a pure democracy, the better we'll be. But a pure democracy means 51% of the people can tell the other minority what they must do. And the entire Constitution was designed to make sure the majority could not subject the minority to its will. And that's exactly what the national popular vote would do. If you don't think that's a good idea, vote against 113. Mr. Williams, thank you very much for that opening statement. Thank you both. Gentlemen, now you can offer a rebuttal to the other's opening statement. And Mr. Williams, you can go first with that rebuttal. Thank you very much. And I just want to talk about this, this concept of democracy because that does seem to be the underlying premise behind why the national popular vote is a good idea. But if we all consider it, we know it is not. And we know from our middle school government classes that that is exactly the reason the Constitution was formed. And it's got some bad stuff in here, but not all of it is bad, and this is one of the things that is good. If we have a pure democracy, 51% of the people can ban a book. 51% of the people can ban a religion. 
They can force them to close. 51% of the people could force all the redheads to go back to Ireland. We do not have a democracy, and there's a reason for that. And Colorado should not sacrifice its sovereignty, its electoral college votes, so that the more populous states, which already have more electoral college votes, can tell us what we must do. Mr. Williams, thank you for that rebuttal. Mr. McClosey, you can offer a rebuttal. Thank you. First of all, DK, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Uh, we're neighbors in South Denver. And we're going to have a civil debate this evening. <laughs> At its core, this is constitutional. Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution, which has been backed by three famous United States Supreme Court decisions, including the famous Bush v. Gore decision in the year 2000, have said states have complete or plenary control to decide the manner of their electors. For example, the state of North Carolina has changed the way it allocates its electors about four times over 100 years. The state of Massachusetts has changed the way it allocates its electors 11 times over 200 years by a simple vote in the state house, the state senate, and the governor's signature. When Colorado passed this bill in March of 2019, which then Governor Polis signed, it's because we want the most votes should win and every vote should count equally. But this is strictly constitutional based on Article 2, Section 1. Mr. McClosey, thank you for that rebuttal. Gentlemen, we're moving on to cross-examination. This is an opportunity to, for you to question each other. And Mr. McClosey, we'll begin with you. Mr. Will, you can ask Mr. Williams a question, and then Mr. Williams, you'll have one minute to respond. Mr. McClosey, your first question. Mr. Williams, what do you think is the biggest mythology of the national popular vote? Biggest mythology? Well, that would be something that people misunderstand about it. So I guess the thing that they misunderstand about it is the ra kind of what I've talked about is that the idea that a pure democracy is a good idea, that, that the closer we can get to a pure democracy, the better off we'll be. If the entire country can vote for the president, that's a good idea. Because the entire idea was that each of the individual states, the original 13 states, did not want that to happen because Rhode Island, for example, or Maryland, or Delaware, did not want to be swarmed over, be overwhelmed by what Massachusetts or New York or Virginia did. So I think it's important to understand this history, which I think has been lost. I think that is something people don't understand, is that there's a reason behind it, and that reason is still as valid today as it was for Rhode Island, as it is for Colorado now. Gentlemen, thank you. Mr. Williams, it is now your turn. Cross-examination round one. You can ask Mr. McClosey a question. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. McClosey, why do we have a constitutional republic and not a pure democracy? And would it be better if we just adopted a pure majority rule so that minorities, like Colorado would be in a presidential election perhaps, are subject to the will of the rest of the country and the majority? We are a republic as well as a representative democracy. And when Prop 113, yes on national popular vote passes, we're still going to be a republic and a representative democracy. But we're going to avoid the problem that's happened five times in our country's history out of 45 presidents, which is the person with the most votes did actually not win. And this is a critical, critical issue. Now, back to the other argument Mr. Williams was talking about, about mythology. The biggest argument you'll hear against national popular vote is that they think the largest states, the largest cities, will garner all of the presidential campaign attention, both Republican and Democratic. Nothing could be further from the truth. You don't get 50% plus one votes if you only campaign in Houston, in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York City. In fact, if you add up the 100 largest cities, of which Colorado Springs is number 42, they only make up 17% of the population, and they're equaled out by the rural communities at 17% we will become a, a, a broader country in terms of the campaigns having to speak to everyone. Mr. McClosey, thank you. And now, Mr. Williams, we're moving on to cross-examination round two, and we'll switch orders. So you get to go first. You can ask another question of Mr. McClosey. All right, thank you. It seems to me that the reasoning, the rationale behind trying to get rid of the Electoral College or to support the national popular vote is that if we dispose of the Electoral College vote, and we follow that reasoning, why don't we likewise dispose of the composition of the United States Senate, where Wyoming gets two senators and so does California, which is exactly the same situation as we have in the Electoral College um, uh, setup that we have now. So 
if we follow the conclusion of the argument that we don't need an electoral college, shouldn't we also redefine how we compose the United States Senate? Mr. Here, Williams, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Here's the beautiful thing about the national popular vote. It still preserves and protects the electoral college. It does not remove it. We are a republic as well as representative democracy, but here's the critical piece of information. If we got rid of Electoral College, the United States Congress, not the 50 states, would decide election law. I sometimes joke with my friends, would you want Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi deciding election law? If you're a liberal, you don't want Mitch McConnell deciding election law for all 50 states. He'd make you own three guns and four forms of identification to vote. I'm being somewhat facetious, but not that far off. If you're a conservative, do you really want Nancy Pelosi making election law for all 50 states? She'd let everyone in the world vote. The Electoral College will still be preserved. And that's why Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, which three famous U.S. Supreme Court decisions have backed up to say the states have complete authority to decide the manner of their electors. Mr. McClosey, thanks for that response. And now you have an opportunity to ask one more question of uh, Mr. Williams. Why, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, why do you not think the National Popular Vote Agreement is constitutional? Oh, I don't, I'm not saying it's not constitutional. Not, not at all. Because as you pointed out, I mean, and I think it's a good idea for people, uh, I encourage everyone to read it. That is a great idea for everyone to read it. It's absolutely constitutional. And I don't think I've said it's not. It's not a good idea. We can amend the Constitution. And the way that the uh, National Popular Vote Interstate Compact would work is if enough states adopt it and we get the, the 270 electoral college votes that would be needed to win the presidency, the Constitution says the Congress still has to approve it. So even if enough states do it, it's still not done because the Constitution says Congress must approve any interstate compact. So uh, Congress could approve it, and then a different Congress could disapprove it. So the way to do this, and my suggestion for everyone, is if we're going to do it, we do it by amending the Constitution like we've done 30, 40 other times in order to do it so it is a permanent response and not something that is still subject to the Congress um, because the Constitution has a reason for it, so let's amend the Constitution to do it. Mr. Williams, thank you for that. Mr. McClosey, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you both for that cross-examination round. And now we're moving on to the card questions submitted by the forum organizers. You'll have one minute to answer each of these questions. Each of you will have exactly one minute. And Mr. McClosey, we'll start with you with the first question. This is from the debate organizers. What conditions would have to be met before Colorado would change how it allocates its electoral college votes, even if its participation in the national popular vote agreement continues? Mr. McClosey. Thank you. The elegant solution of the national popular vote is that our nine electors will still meet on that third Monday in December of a presidential election year at the state capitol open for media. We will pledge our nine electoral college votes to the presidential candidate who actually wins the national popular vote in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. That system will still be set in place. And also, in all 50 states, the election law will still be run by that respective state. That's the beauty and elegance of this solution. Thank you, Mr. McClosey. Mr. Williams, you have one minute to answer the same question um, on conditions. What conditions would have to be met before Colorado would change how it allocates those electoral votes. Well, the, and the way the, the proposition is, is worded is that 270 electoral college votes, states that represent 270, which is the minimum needed to, to win the presidency, would have to adopt it. And we're not there yet. So if Colorado adopts it, we're a little bit closer to it. Other states would still have to do it. And I think it's important to remember that Colorado does have nine electoral college votes. And, I don't, and, and Mr. McCloskey talks about how the this national popular vote compact would preserve the electoral college. Well, it's kind of like a refrigerator can preserve ice cream, but it's just not really going to do the same thing. It's not doing the same thing. Because if Colorado in 2020, and it wouldn't take effect in 2020, the earliest it could take effect would be later than that. But in some future election, if Colorado votes for the Republican, but the Democrat wins the entire national popular vote, or vice versa, this is going to make Colorado's very vote thrown out and made meaningless. So I suggest we don't do that. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. McClosey, thank you. Moving on to card question number two. And uh, Mr. Williams, you'll get to answer first um, with this round. Who sponsored, this is on sponsorship of propositions. Who sponsored this proposition and where does the majority of the funding come from? Is it from in-state or out-of-state? 
<laughs> well, I know I'm in state and I oppose it. I'm not sure about the, uh, the overall um, uh, method behind it, but I do know, and I've talked to Michael Baca, who was a Colorado elector, elected by the Democrats in 2016. He was the one that took his case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And he had backing from a national organization. And there, I don't have any particular issue with that. But if Michael Baca had won, and he did not, because he was a Bernie supporter, Bernie Sanders supporter. And when the election happened and Donald Trump won, he was among a lot of people, including some Republicans, who were like, I don't know if this is a good idea. Can we do anything to stop Donald Trump from winning. Well, if Michael Baca, the Bernie Sanders supporter, had won and had his way, the electors would have had discretion as originally intended. And there's really no dispute about that. We want to change it, but originally electors were going to have absolute discretion. If Michael Baca and other electors across the country had their discretion, they could have stopped that if that's what they wanted to do. And now they cannot. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. McClosey, same question. Do you do you know who, where the sponsorship is coming from? Is it out of state, in state? So there's a reason about 7,000 small dollar donors at $25 a piece throughout Colorado and the region have donated to Prop 113, yes on national popular vote, which is one of the most highest number of small dollar donors because they believe the most votes should win and every vote should count equally. Well over half of our money have come from people through almost all the 64 counties of Colorado. Mr. McClosey, thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you. Card question number three, and uh, this is, uh, again, a, su a submission from the forum organizers. And Mr. McClosey, you can go first in this round. Uh, Two-part question. What does polling show for the passage of the national popular vote in the next four years by the required percentage of states' electoral votes, and what could be done to persuade or dissuade more states to get on board? So our latest poll last week showed 82% of Democrats, 62% of, of unaffiliated voters, and 33% of Republicans in Colorado supporting national popular vote. Gallup poll after Gallup poll nationally shows that about 78%. Again, because the most votes should win and every vote should count equally. What I think is fascinating about this discussion is that people know instinctively those two core values will still preserve our republic, but they want the most votes to win. Mr. McClosey, thank you. Mr. Williams, same question, um, two-part question, actually. What does polling show for the passage of the national popular vote in the next four years? And then also, what could be done to persuade or dissuade more states in this very polarized political atmosphere? Well, I'll trust Joe in the poll numbers, but the only poll that matters is the one that happens when we all vote for it. And this idea that, that we need to make every vote count, well, it, it does. Every vote counts in Colorado to award those nine electoral college votes that we have. There is no reason for any political uh, a candidate to visit the states where it's already a, a done deal. And Colorado has just over, almost six million people, over five, just over six million people. California has almost seven times that amount. Whose state, who has got the more votes that's going to matter in a poll, the actual election? It's gonna be Colorado. It's not gonna be Colorado, it's going to be California seven times as many people as Colorado has. So if we right now, we might have one, uh, one vote out of the entire state. But if we take that to the entire country, or even compare it to California, our vote is diminished by a fraction of what it would be otherwise. So that is the reason that it is important for Colorado to keep control of its electoral college votes and not give them to another state. Mr. Williams, thanks. Mr. McClosey, thanks. Um, you'll have an opportunity to answer another question and perhaps offer a rebuttal to that. Moving on to card question number four. And uh, Mr. Williams, you'll get to go first. And I really appreciate the healthy and respectful conversation that you are both uh, having tonight. It serves the viewers well. Mr. Williams, how do you think presidential campaigning, and you both alluded to this earlier, but how do you think presidential campaigning will change if the national popular vote is approved in the U.S. with the majority of states signing on? Well, if electoral, if electoral college votes no longer mean anything, if it's just a national popular vote, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, North Dakota, South Dakota, and a whole bunch of other states are not even going to be an issue. It's not going to be an issue. And people can say they're going to be an issue, but it's not. When Colorado has six million people and California has seven times as many. There's no reason to come here unless Colorado's electoral college votes are up for grabs. And if you look back to 2016, Hillary Clinton 
lost Wisconsin because she didn't go there. She assumed she was going to win Wisconsin and those electoral college votes. If she had gone, if she had fought for those electoral college votes, she would have won Wisconsin and she would have been the, the United States president right now. Can you imagine what would happen if those electoral college votes didn't mean anything? States like Colorado would just be an afterthought and our 5 million population and far fewer votes than that wouldn't mean a thing. So let's keep it. Let's keep it meaning something. Mr. Williams, thanks. Mr. McClosey, same question. You. you can also offer that rebuttal Thank to you. his uh, last response if you'd like. How do you think presidential campaigning will change if the national popular vote is approved in the U.S. with a majority of states signing on? Both presidential campaigns, Republican and Democratic, as well as, quote, uh, minor party presidential campaigns will have to expand to all 50 states, not go to six battleground states, of which Colorado no longer is one. Again, those states vote with 10 percent higher frequency, receive billions of dollars of extra federal government grants once the president's elected, and um, they wield way too much political power and influence. I have to respectfully disagree with Mr. Williams. He's confusing the James Madison Virginia Compromise, which allocated two United States senators to each state and U.S. representatives based on population. That was the brokered deal that the 55 Constitutional Convention participants created in 1789 in Philadelphia. The Electoral College has nothing to do with small states. If you look at the 13 smallest states like Wyoming, which is red or Republican, and then Vermont, which is Bernie Sanders blue, when's the last time a presidential campaign has gone to either state? They haven't. New Hampshire is the only one they go to because it's 50 percent Republican and 50 percent Democratic. Let's expand this to be a battleground country. Way to go. Thank you. Way to go, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Moving on to card question number five. And uh, Mr. McClosey, you can answer first. This is on campaign finance laws. Do you envision the passage of the national popular vote in the U.S. would then affect any aspect of campaign finance laws? Mr. McClosey. No, I don't. And here's why. Each side, Democratic and Republican, spends about $1.5 billion, which seems like a lot of money, in a presidential election year. But when you're trying to communicate with 330 million Americans, some of those are, are kids and cannot vote, that's still a, a, a massive task. And I have to go back to his California argument. People like to make that the boogeyman. Did you know the most Republicans that live in the country live in the state of California? And it's 40 percent Republican. My Republican friends, like my father, who's a strong Catholic conservative, they're disillusioned when they think about Colorado because they know this state is becoming more liberal, progressive. Imagine, I want to speak to my, my Republican friends now because I'm a Democrat. Imagine if you're a Republican in this state and you could join arms with Republicans across the country. You may lose Colorado, but you know your vote will count across the borders in a national tally. That'll motivate you and get you excited to vote, as it will my friends who are unaffiliated, green, libertarian, or Democratic. Mr. McClosey, thank you. And Mr. Williams, your turn to answer that question. Do you envision the passage of the national popular vote in the U.S. would then affect any aspect of campaign finance laws? Well, states' laws aren't going to be nearly as important as the federal ones if that happens, because states' votes are no longer going to be important as much as they are now under Electoral College. And speaking about the, all the Republicans in California, yeah, it's a much bigger state. Hillary Clinton's margin of victory in California in 2016 was more than the population of Colorado. Where is the fight going to be? Is it going to be over a negligible difference when 5 million people and votes are far fewer than that? But when the margin of victory in California dwarfs the entire population of the state of Colorado, I, kinda, I, I don't see an argument that the national popular vote is going to help Colorado. It seems untenable much less Wyoming and the other smaller states. So sovereignty is an important concept here. We live in Colorado. Other people live in different states. Those states have sovereignty, and Rhode Island and the smaller colonies originally did make that important. So it is still important. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. McClosey, thank you. We ran out of time for question number six um, from the card question submitted. So now we're moving to uh, our closing statements. And uh, we're going to reverse order um, of the opening statements. That means Mr. Williams will be going first. Each of you will have one minute to deliver your closing statements. And again, uh, Mr. Williams, you can begin. Thank you very much. And thank you, Joe. This has been great. I think it's a very important discussion to have. Um, every state is sovereign. And if California wants to adopt all kinds of crazy legislation, they can do it. And the Constitution is designed to make sure they don't have the power to do it to the rest of us. 
That's why the federal government and the state governments are separate things. It's the major structure of the United States government in the United States Constitution. A national popular vote is one more thing that does away with that. It does away with the sovereignty of Colorado and makes it subject, not just to California, but New York and Illinois and Texas and Florida, wherever. It dwarfs us. It, it will be a tsunami, a tsunami of votes that makes Colorado irrelevant. So instead of giving bigger states more control over us, let us keep our say. Let us keep our nine electoral college votes. Let us keep our influence over the selection of the president. And I ask you to consider rejecting national popular vote and Prop 113. Mr. Williams, thank you very much. Mr. McClosey, we're ready for your closing. My fellow Coloradans, every vote should count equally and the most votes should win. When you think about this, that just makes sense. There's a woman that cuts my hair named Chantel, and she doesn't follow politics that frequently. And I was trying to explain this to her. And then she mentioned her daughter's running for a junior class president. I said, what if your daughter got the most votes, but the principal made the second place finisher the winner? She turned my chair around. She goes, pitchforks. There's a basic sense that the American voter believes the most votes should win. The elegance of the national popular vote is that it preserves the sovereignty of each state. And I have to address this. If you add up the, the 100 biggest cities in America, they only make up 17% of the population. They vote 60% Democratic and 40% Republican. If you add up this, the rural communities, they also make up 17% of the population and vote 60% Republican, 40% Democratic. The other two thirds live in the suburbs. You don't win the White House unless you win the suburbs. And I want both campaigns to appeal to the middle. Mr. McClosey, thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you for your participation here. That was dynamic. It was great. It was respectful. Way to go, guys. You <laughs> talked about that before the debate started, and uh, you honored that. So we appreciate thank you, Mr. it. Williams. Thank you. Thank um, you. On behalf of the forum organizers, I'd also like to thank you both for your participation in the forum. The, uh, we hope that we have given you a fair look at the pros and cons of Proposition 113. Again, this measure asks voters to affirm or reject the legislature's 2019 decision to join the National Popular Vote Compact. The agreement intends to commit a state's presidential election votes to the candidate who wins the most votes nationally rather than the candidate who wins the state. Our thanks also to Denver Decides partners, which include Interneighborhood Cooperation and the League of Women Voters of Denver. Denver Decides is presented by Denver 8 TV. Remember, Election Day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Let your voice be heard. Be sure you're registered and get out there and vote. For complete election information online, go to denverdecides.org. I'm Russell Haythorn with Denver 7. Thank you for joining us.